Now, there's always questions that come up about the constitutionality of telling me what I can do with my property. And they always want to point to this thing called the 14th Amendment, which says that you are not supposed to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. However, I will tell you, when these get exercised or this court case comes about, they almost always lose because the health, safety, and welfare typically outdoes your individual right to do with the property what I want, all right? So there are some tests that they use to determine whether that zoning is actually valid. Uh, and you can seek these tests out. Is their power of the zoning board exercised reasonably? Are the zoning laid out clear and concise? Is there any kind of discriminatory practice being used? Does it truly promote the health, safety, and general welfare? Because that is the key in this entire thing, is making sure that you are protected from someone else's activities. Zoning permits are things that are issued based upon the zoning ordinance inside of the zoning laws. And when you want to change the zoning, you may go in front of the Board of Appeals or the zoning board to actually make your case as to I want to change the zoning. And typically there are three types of changes that I want to talk about. So I want to go over here and use this. The first type of change is this thing called a non-conforming use. So let's draw, here's a road and let's assume there are four structures here on this side of the road. Well, let me give you the backstory. These structures were originally built as homes. They are originally residential. So they were being lived in. And this was a little two lane road. Well, over the years, this road has become a very prominent highway and has gotten now a lot bigger. And these structures actually have started becoming a little small doctor's office, a little small dentist office, maybe even a real estate brokerage. And the city has determined that now because of the growth of the population, that this all land should be rezoned to be commercial property. However, there is still one person living in this house, but they cannot live in a commercially zoned area that violates zoning laws. But this person was here first it's not fair to them. You can't make them move. So they would be issued what is called a non-conforming permit. Yes, we understand that what they are doing does not conform to the current zoning but they have been given special permission. The other way to look at this is they are grandfathered in. They were there first. Everybody else had changed around them. It's not fair that they should have to move and they are issued a non-conforming use permit. This applies to property that is not being currently used to meet the current zoning, but it was there first. And that non-conforming use would be granted to this example, to this person living in the house, and they would then continue to use or live in that house 
like it was originally intended. They are grandfathered in and are now not required to meet the current zoning of commercial. That is a non-conforming use. Now, one that is kind of similar is one that is called a conditional use permit to allow that current property owner to do something that may be allowable within that zoning, but they're just not currently doing that. So let's go back and look at this. We're going to use this same drawing. Let's say there are four houses right here. I'm going to erase this a little bit. There are four houses, but this one house right here now wants to open a daycare. They want to do something that is special and they want to open a daycare. In this scenario, this property that's in red is different, but in this case, they sought the change to make them look different. This would be seeking a special use or a conditional use permit. They are doing something different than what is currently there, but it's still a line, still allowable. So like maybe a house of worship, a church, a daycare. Maybe they want to open a small dog grooming parlor in the garage. They are going to appear different, but it's because they sought the change out. In the very first one up here, that red house appeared different, but it was because everybody else changed around them. They were the original one. Notice the difference in those. If you don't, hit me up with an email and we'll try and talk through it a little further. Both of these look different, but one of them is because they were there first and grandfathered in. The other one is they sought it out and are seeking to look different through this conditional use. The third thing that they may grant is what's called a variance. A variance is just an alteration of a permanent zoning ordinance that is already in place. I mentioned this thing called a setback zoning. So let me draw somebody's yard. And most houses are built here in the middle. And just about every residential lot has some sort of setback so that the house is not built too close to the property line. So in this example, I'm going to make this up. Let's say there is a setback from the side property that requires the house be no closer than 10 feet to the edge of the property. That is so in case we need to do something. Maybe a, a, a water line utility easement may be coming. We don't know. So when the builder builds these, they build these to meet whatever the setback is. And I am making these numbers up. And maybe that one's 10 feet. And the one in front is going to be a little bigger. We're going to say it's got to be at least 20 feet. That would define where the property goes. Now, in this scenario, the owner of the building says, hey, man, I want to build a garage because I've got some extra cars and I want to build my garage, but it will encroach upon this setback. I want to seek a variance of that 10 feet so that I can have a special condition and only make it two feet for that garage. That would be a variance of the setback standard. That is exampled or explained what they are talking about right here. Okay. That is, they're not changing it. They're just varying it from a 10 foot setback to maybe an eight foot setback. 
that would be the variance. If I were the test person, I would assume that these three are probably very good questions for your exam. Understanding the difference between non-conforming and conditional use as opposed to a variance, okay? Another way that the man can hold you down through zoning, we've mentioned, was this thing called a building code. Well, it's my property, my building. I can build it however I want. I want to build it out of Lincoln Logs. No, that would not be safe for someone to visit your building if it was built out of paper mache. So there are standards that tell a developer, if you want to build a commercial building for public access, like an office building or a retail strip center, or a movie theater, or a roller rink. There are building codes that you must meet. These building codes are a set of engineering standards to protect the people through the health, safety, and welfare. I have said that many times, probably very important, all right? So even though you think you have control and I can build this 12-story building out of balsa wood because it's my building, I got control. No, there are going to be requirements. And if you're building that, you as the developer must submit plans to the building inspector who is going to review those to make sure that you are in fact using steel two by fours and you are in fact putting in an automatic sprinkler for fire suppression. And when they pass the building code, they will give you the building permit to build that building and you better build that building like the plans say because if the inspector comes out and catches you that you said you were going to do this, but you went ahead and built it out of paper mache anyway, they're going to stop your project and probably fine you and maybe even sentence you through a criminal court, depending on what happens. So they require periodic construction inspections. You know, you got the permit to build this new two-story office building. You better build what the permit said and the permit comes from those standards and when you submit it they could potentially say hey dude we don't like this plan you need to make sure that there is a fire sprinkler so redo your plans and resubmit them back to us and then we'll give you the go ahead now there is a very special set of building codes for the residential world. In the residential world, the home builder must submit his plans for this new home to the building inspector. And the building inspector is going to look at this residential property and he is going to determine if the plans are acceptable based on the current building codes for residential. One of the best examples is, I don't know what year, but you guys know it's true. There is now a building code that says a plug-in that is within th six feet of a water source has to be that grounded three-prong plug, right? Well, that is new in the relative life of building homes. I mean, some of the old homes still have the two-prong plugs. Well, if it's like near your kitchen sink, the building code says it's now got to be a grounded plug with that third ground in there. That would be an example so that the building or the plan reviewer that's looking at that looks at all of those plans and goes, oh, there's the kitchen sink, there's the bathroom sink, there's the plug-in, that plug-in is identified as a three-prong grounded plug. Check that meets the building code. And if it all passes, that builder will be issued what is called a certificate of occupancy, meaning 
that if he builds the house, just like the plans say he's going to, this house is safe for the person to live in. The doors all locked, the windows lock, it's properly ventilated, it has great insulation, whatever the building code is for that specific municipality. A good example would be Florida versus Indiana. Florida may have hurricane uh, requirements that the building has to withstand hurricanes where that's not really a big issue in Indiana, okay? And if it is, we've got a whole other problems we have to deal with. So there could be a requirement that the metal beams in a building, if you're building in, say, Orlando or at Palm or at, uh, uh, I don't know, any of those. I, I don't live down there, so I don't know. They may have to be able to withstand 110 mile an hour winds. That could be part of the building code for buildings in Florida where that may not be in Indiana. Well, in the residential, this certificate of occupancy may be required or actually will be required only one time. It is going to be used from the original home builder to the very first buyer. When that buyer buys a new build home, one of the documents in the closing package is going to be this certificate of occupancy that says this house is safe for human to occupy.